If you'd be so kind, take out your Bibles as we welcome those on uh, watching us next week on video. And go to Colossians chapter 3. We have been preaching on building lives on the truth. The truth of the Word of God will transform. Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Some weeks ago, we preached that in the believer's life, you're saved. But there is that onworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives that the Word of God is taken by the Spirit of God, which challenges an action, a motive, some aspect of our lives, call it stinking thinking, looks right, but it's just wrong, and God says, we need to change this. And I'm going to show you how Christ's likeness works. So we take, Bible says we take it off, and we put it on. Last Sunday, we preached that we needed to take off the lifestyle of stealing and embrace the blessings of work. Amen? And now today, I want us to take a journey. Go to Colossians chapter 3, and I pray it's going to be a most joyful journey. Starting in verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, he says, because you've been born again, put on. Now remember, if you're going to put on something, you have to take off something, right? Every person in this room has probably run up against the wall of, I need to get up earlier and have a devotion time in the Bible before I go to work. The problem is you're still going to bed at the same time. All right? You can't watch TV till your brain is the size of a pea and your eyes are as big as moon pies and expect to be energized in the morning. You got to take something off if you're going to put something in. Amen? And God comes and he says, listen, I want you to put this on. I want you to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. The reason we need to put it on, because without Christ, we have the opposite in our lives. Verse 13, bearing one with one another and forgiving one another. That's a novel thought. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Underline the word let. You can fight that. He says, let it, the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you also you were called in one body. And here's the sermon. You ready? And be thankful. Be thankful. If you don't mind underlining in your Bible, underline, be thankful. Be thankful. As a believer, you desire to to grow in Christ's likeness, we were predestined to do it, you have to have a great, a thankful heart. You have to be thankful. And that has to be created by the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Look, here's the progression that we see in these verses. We see, we see that by the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, He's helping me to put stuff off and put them on. And I see my deeds change. I was unforgiving. I'm becoming forgiving. I was unkind. I'm becoming kind. Tenderhearted. My goodness. My goodness. Now, you know, that wasn't hard for me. 
At my house, anybody ever watched the movie Old Yeller? Okay. For a long time, I thought Old Yeller was my mama's cousin's tooth. He had this big, one big, long tooth. But then I saw the Disney movie, Old Yeller. I cried like a hyena. I waited for the day I could shoot my own dog. I'll do it. Just a great, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Rent a movie. It's wonderful. If it, of course, well, no, let me put a disclaimer. It will trigger some of you. Okay? But that's good. Sometimes we, we just need to not be triggerable. To be tender hearted. God says, I'm going to make you a man that you're going to be new deeds. I'm going to give you a new direction to journey in. Instead of getting even, I want you to get godly. There is a part about that because our decisions are different. Now, what's the key on this? In all deathbed seriousness, the key is getting to the place where we are grateful and thankful before God for the challenges that He brings that he institutes change in my life. I need to be thankful. An ungrateful heart. Guys, how many churches have you been in and the people are just grumbly hateful? They are. You come in, nobody tells you, hey, hi, or shut up. I mean, it's as though you don't exist. God wants us to be humbly grateful. I'm grateful that I'm saved. I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful to learn to be that way. To have a thankful heart is to have a hopeful life. Without it, I don't give you much of a chance at all. You're going to be miserable, and there ain't a thing I can do about it because you reap what you sow, beloved. You reap what you sow. People come to me for counseling and I, I, I listen and I'm glad to be a part and to help. But here's the rule. You ready? Number one, you reap what you sow. Rule number two, I can't change rule number one. You want something different coming up in your life? You got to plant something different. And a grateful heart and a thankful heart is the way. So how do I become? Here's, here's the, here is the title to the message. I don't always give you the title to the message. I'll let you figure it out. This one is how to build a life of thankfulness. How to build a life of thankfulness. There's five things that is God is going to work to make you thankful when he's going to challenge you about being hard-hearted. He's going to say, I want you to show them mercy. You don't know what you did to me. The song, done somebody wrong song, is very popular. But Dennis, you don't think people do you wrong? Of course they do you wrong. I can't change when people do wrong, but I am in control of my response to that and how you deal with it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a run now. If you'll listen faster, I'm going to go a lot, lot quicker. You ready? Number one. Number one. God's going to start with your person, with you. God is going to start with you. Most of the time, when we have these issues, we talk to God about other people. God talks to us about us first. In Romans chapter 12, I'm talking to believers. If you are not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, just Just eavesdrop in, because God wants to show you how wonderful a life in Jesus is. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I'm begging you, by the mercies of God, that what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove and know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God says you have been bought with a price. 
You belong to Jesus. Your job is to act and present yourself that you belong to Jesus. Too many Baptists have bought into this kind of weird theology of perpetual, backslidden, just wrestling with agreeing with God. <coughs> but, beloved, you don't get a medal for that. It's not good. I had a man, a dear brother, he would, he would tell me. He would say, I'd say, how you doing? He'd say, man, God's breaking me. And then we'd meet again. God's breaking me. The third time, I said, what is wrong with you? He said, what? I said, break yourself. I mean, submit to God. God knows what he's doing. Don't fight him. You're wrong. He's right. You're losing. I know it sounds spiritual, but it's dumb. Amen? Oh, I can tell I'm winning y'all over. Listen, to admit, here's the altar. It's the place of offering myself to God. He has saved me. And I'm saying, Lord, here I am. It has to be willful. Every day, I'm saying, Lord, I'm not fighting you. I belong to you. I want to follow you. I know all the ways I think are not right. So I need you to get rid of stinking thinking in my head by your truth. And grant me grace to agree with you. Because there's a lot of things like right here that we just love to hold on to. Grudges is a big one. Unforgiveness is a big one. All of these different areas. And it is a terrible, terrible cost that happens in our lives. See, you have to voluntarily, I present myself completely. Lord, I don't even know where you, where you need to look in my life. But I want the Holy Spirit to move as I'm in the Word and I'm sitting under God works. Let me give you, might seem silly to you, okay? When I got saved, they were, and I was in jail, in parish prison, there were three, I didn't even understand this, but God helped me, there were three besetting sins that really identified my life. And I understood that to come to this, this, this God, I was done with that. God grant me grace. After I got saved, I didn't understand that God was just going to keep working in my life. He was going to keep working. They, I had a, this all came back to my mind. I had a buddy. He called me yesterday. He was flying to Memphis. Now, this is one of my best friends. He's never been on the bayou, but he's heard my bayou stories. And there was two, a man and his wife sitting by him on the plane, and they introduced each other, and his name was Shadomi. And he went, wait a minute. Where did you grow up? And he said, I grew up in Cutoff. That's right where I grew up, on the bayou. He said, do you know Dennis Brunet? Guys, I've been gone from the bayou since I was 19 years old. And... And here's what he told my buddy. He said, oh, yeah, that's Levi Brunet's son. He said, that was one wild dude. <laughs> and my buddy said, oh, yeah? He said, yeah, but you know, he found religion. And he changed. Thank the Lord, that's what he said. <laughs> but my buddy said, it gave me a great opportunity to witness to he and his wife that it wasn't religion, it was Jesus that had changed your life. See, I got saved. Now, I was going to push on. I should be on point three. This is for some group of people in this room to understand the Christian life. Stop having Jesus chase you. Grow up. He saved us by the mercies of God. We are bought with a price. It wasn't, it wasn't many months after I got saved. Well, probably about six, seven months. I was in church. Beck's dad was the pastor. I was there. 
I got to where, and this was an old time church, man. They call you to pray in church. You'd stand up and pray, and it was a very small building. And and we would have at it. And I got to where every time I stood up to pray, I'd cry. I'm not talking sniffles. I'm talking just like, is he having a nervous breakdown kind of crying? And I thought I was cracking up. And I came out the bathroom, the little church. So the men's bathroom was here. The hall passed here, went about right there and turned this way, like a 90 degree, like an L. And I came out and I'm going, what is wrong with me? And there was some men talking. I couldn't see them, but I could hear their voices. And being that we only had about 50 members, I knew exactly who they were. And one of them, they were talking about me. And one of them said, what do you think's wrong with Dennis? And God said, I don't know, something's wrong. And all of a sudden, old Dick Young walked up, didn't see him, just heard it. And he said, ain't nothing wrong with that boy. He was from Texas, working in the oil fields. He said, ain't nothing wrong with that boy. Y'all leave him alone. God's dealing with him. I had never thought of that. That the source of my misery was that God was dealing with me. And my job was to let God deal and just say, Lord, show me. Amen. I'm with you. Too many of us get on the altar, then we crawl off. We get right with God a while, then we take off. The old dean at the seminary where I taught as a teaching fellow called me one time. He knew I was going to be leaving. He said, Dennis, listen to Papa Joe. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're going to spend your life. People coming, they all twisted out of shape. You're going to talk to them and word of God. You're going to put them all straight. If you don't want to touch them again, be a mortician. Because that you can only straighten out dead people like that. But the people that are living, they keep squirming. Amen? And so the Spirit of God wiggles us and gets us. But my job is to stay, Lord, I want to be on the altar. Make any sense to you? Guys, say, Brother Dennis, that's self-evident. It's not easily lived. And it's highly uncommon, though it's what God expects in our lives. Not for us to change, but for us to let Him change us. And be willing. And be thankful about it. Number two. What's the second part that God's going to move? You want to be right with God? You want to grow in this life, a thankful life? You're going to praise God. You're going to incorporate praise into your person. The Bible says this. Listen to me big. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Therefore, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Praise is a sacrifice. Because most of the time, praising God where it matters costs you something. It costs something. You have to let go of something. I'm going to offer it. Guys, the singing this morning I thought was beautiful. I thought, I thought the movement of the worship. Did you sing? Well, it ain't my thing. God says you're supposed to sing. Now, how beautiful we sing, I have no idea. But I sing because I'm a Christian. Amen? Because there's the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's not about me. It's not about me. God created Christians to sing. Rebecca sings with great, perfect pitch. God gave me volume. Okay? You stand around me. Everybody knows who sits by me over here. Brother Dennis sings loud. And if you listen through the whole song, I sing everybody's part. Okay? 
We need to praise. We need to be a praising people. The power of praise. In Psalm, listen to this, Psalm 69, verse 30 and 31. The psalmist writes, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull which has horns and hooves. What God says, if you're not willing to praise me, I want your praise more than I want your tithe. You can give without love. God says, I'd rather you love me. Well, man, then if I love the Lord, I don't get to give. If you love him, you're going to give. Where your heart is, your treasure goes. I love my grandchildren. I ridiculously love my grandchildren. Beck has to remind me. I mean, they'll say, Papa, you're the best. I'll get you a pony. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I just want to, I just want to give. We went up, took a, because I've been sick, took, took a trip, got to go see some, brought their Christmas presents. Beck loves to do stockings, stockings. We couldn't find stockings. My, my feet are so big, she just used my socks. Anyway, teasing. But, man, we boxed it. We had it. It's there. We go all the way up there. We left the stockings. We left the stockings. I didn't touch the stockings. I didn't fill the stockings. I didn't even know where the stockings were, but I knew it was my fault because I'm a husband. <laughs> Gentlemen, that's a tip. That's you want. It's just I don't care what happens. A meteorite hits your house. I'm sorry, honey. I built in the wrong place. That's just you. It's a happy marriage. Just agree. <laughs> that's how we bless God. Because we praise Him. Why? Because we're able to see what God is doing. Now. There's a weird twist that's happened. Are you all still with me? There's a weird twist where we come to church and we say, I'm coming to church to recharge. There's truth in that. But there's danger in that. Because listen to what the Bible says here. You ready? In Jeremiah 33, 11. It says, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom. We know in the New Testament, that's Jesus. And the voice of the bride, that's the church of the redeemed. The voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good. For his mercy endures forever. Now listen. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. There is a place where I don't come in here to learn praise. I come in here charged up with praise. And when we get together and we begin praising God in song, that which is praising in me just comes out. Amen? Guys, there are times when life will ring you out and you come in and you're dragging. And praise God, this is the best place to be. But don't live your life every week like that. Praise God through the week. See the hand of God at work. And when I come to church, I'm bringing the praise of God with me. Amen? Put something off. Put something on. I need to hustle. My goodness. Y'all are listening slow today. I want to have a life, of, life filled with thankfulness. I want to be thankful. When you're thankful, you're pleasant. You're pleasant. You're grateful. We see it when we submit ourselves to the Lord to look at us by the praise that comes out by our prayers. Why are you putting praise before prayer? Because that's what Jesus did. We want to pray so we can praise God. You got it backwards. How's that working for you? When they looked at Jesus and they said, look, 
you, you pray different from us. Teach us. He started the Lord's Prayer. It bookends. There's praise at the beginning and there's praise at the end. My prayer is bookend by praise. I love, the Bible says, Psalm 141, 2, let my prayer be set before you as incense and lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. He gives a picture of the temple. When you came into the temple, you would move. It was a picture of Christ. There was the brazen altar. It was a perpetual fire that was there. That's where the sacrifice was given. It was never lit by man. It was lit by God. Jesus Christ, nobody forced him from heaven. Nobody made him go to the cross. The brazen altar is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we come on the way to the golden altar of incense, which is the prayer of the saints. That's why the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. My prayers, I can come because Jesus Christ has made a way for me. I can come into the Holy of Holies. I can kneel and make my petitions known. My God loves me because I'm His child. I can come, amen? And I can praise Him for that. I come. My prayers make all the difference. But wait. You want to be thankful? You want to have a thankful life, a beautiful life, a life where the Spirit of God is taking out stinking things and putting in the fruits of the Spirit of God and life begins to move in power and transformation. God's not just going to deal with your person or your praise or your prayers. He's also going to deal with your possessions. Possessions. Oh, pastor, you are cruising. Now we come to a screeching halt. It's a dangerous thing to get between a man and his money. That's why when you get baptized at Midway Baptist Church as an adult, we always make sure your wallet's in your pants. <laughs> Just picking. But here's what God says. Not me, God. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. With the first fruits. If you're not careful, the way we give is we spend everything we would want, everything that we think we need, everything, and what's left over goes to the Lord. I guarantee if you do that, you're giving tips. You're giving tips. You got life back to front. Say, but Brother Dennis, I can't. I can't do that. You need to start le learning can. And that trans transforms our lives. So many marriages fight over debt. We just do. You got to be careful. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, you want to listen to this? Kind of a long passage. It's the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1, verse, verse 6. He says, God is speaking. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, God says, Where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way? He, here they're answering God. They're arguing back with God. They're just like us. He says, in what way have we despised your name? God says, you offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? And God says, because you treat my table as contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? If we treated God with the gifts that we provide... 
if we treated others, would they be happy? That's what God's telling them. It's always a condition of the heart. I love what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. He says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Well, Brother Dennis, how much should I give? You give until there is overflowing joy of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, Brother Dennis, I don't think I don't think that's right. Listen to me. I don't know where you go to church and who's your pastor. Does he let you look at his tithing record? He should. He should. You can't look at anybody's tithing record in this church, but you can look at mine. Because any man that'll preach on the word of God and doesn't obey it in money is guilty of filthy lucre, the Bible says, and he doesn't belong in the pulpit. Amen. Guys, I'm not ashamed to give. And when we come across in the giving of money, the giving of possessions, it belongs to God. And I'm not ashamed, and I don't stammer and stutter and preaching on it. Because I preach on something even bigger every Sunday. And that's giving your heart to God. Because, because wherever your heart is, Jesus said, your treasure follows. Amen? You got a giving problem? You got a heart problem. You got a heart problem. Then here's the last one. God wants our purity of getting right. The psalmist says in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you'll not despise. I don't want to have a haughty heart in front of God. I don't want to come to church late and leave unchanged. I don't want that in my lifestyle. I want to treat, I want to treat coming to worship like I'm going to see a movie. I don't want to miss the beginning. Why? Because the beginning is the praise time. Amen? And if we don't praise, we don't listen. Oh, beloved, what are we going to do? There's the purity. David had committed adultery. David had participated in killing a man. David had messed up. What brought him to a broken heart? As Beck comes and makes her way, what, what brought him there? It wasn't that he was caught in his sin. It was, the Bible says, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. God brought conviction and he brought cleansing and he set me free. Amen? He set me free. Oh, beloved, the joy of it all, it's taken off, putting on. Taken off, putting on. God touching here. So I'm not comfortable with that. Squirm, 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 try to get off the altar. We call that backsliding. We call that four-year gaps in our lives where we just disappear from church and then we come back in. Guys, that's not normal. It happens, but God's got better than that. Amen? God's hand at work. I want to be able to see more than just despair in front of my eyes. I want to see the power of God to transform that. And that's where we come. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Come on! Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because I am afraid that for too many people in church... Know about Jesus, but you do have never been born again. Let's imagine. Look, in a moment, we're going to stand up. We're going to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. Why? And I'm going to ask you to come forward. Because the Bible says, with the heart man believes. I'm a sinner. He's the Savior. And with confession, 
that Jesus Christ is Lord, I give all I know of me to Him, we are born again. And we're going to invite you to come. But let's imagine the devil walks forward this morning. He's going to come right up. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. Okay? All right? He comes forward. He says, he says, he says, Pastor, I want to join Midway Baptist Church. And I said, well, I can understand that because it's a great church. I said, but I need to ask you a few questions. He says, okay, go ahead. I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, second person of the Trinity? He'd say, oh, I believe that. I said, okay, that's a pretty good start. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yes, sir. Do you believe, Mr. Devil, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life? He said, we tried to get him to sin. We couldn't. Yeah, the guy's holy. So do you believe he died on the cross? So, man, we made sure he was dead. A soldier stuck him in the side. Do you believe he resurrected from the dead? Yes, sir. We couldn't keep him in. To make fun of us, he had an angel sit on the rock. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Said, we know he's coming back. Well, Mr. Devil, you believe all the right things. Please, join Midway Baptist Church. See, the problem is, all he did was agree with the facts. Faith is what you do with the facts. I'm asking, I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you to be my Savior. Change my life. I want to belong to you. That's salvation. There's some in this room you need to move out of a facts, knowledge, as James warned. You say you believe in one God and you think you do well, but the demons believe that and tremble every day. You need to come, give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Amen? There's some in this room. You're believers. What's God talked to you about today? Because every one of these things could have been individual sermons, right? But I wanted to talk to you about thankfulness. Because when I, God is going to deal with me and I'm thankful. Because... He's taking things off of me and letting me be new. What's God calling you to take off today and to put on? It's not a one-time cures all. It's just a one-time daily. And then there's some. You're looking for a church home. Have you been praying about this one? I'd love to talk to you about it. This, this Sunday is 32 years I've been here. Can you believe that? I can't. But it's true. When I came here, I was slim, good looking. This place has sucked the life out of me. But I've met with over 3,000 folks trying to find God's direction. I'd love to sit and talk with you. And I invite you to come. It'll just be me. This altar's here. Turn it into a burning fire before God. What's God calling you to do? Follow Him.